Shalom. We are continuing to talk about the gospel according to John. I appreciate your patience. It's been a long time since I've been able to update this presentation. I think I've moved twice since I started. Anyway, now we have lots of time to read and study the Word of God. Again, we are looking at the Hebraic background of the book. Beginning in chapter 4, verse 1, When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Yeshua made and baptized more disciples than John, though Yeshua himself baptized not but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee, and he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Yeshua, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. It appears that this site is still known, and that the site of Sychar is the same as the city which is Shechem. In Joshua 24.32 we read, And the bones of Joseph, which the children of Israel brought up out of Egypt, buried they in Shechem, in a parcel of ground which Jacob bought of the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem, for a hundred pieces of silver, and it became the inheritance of the children of Joseph. The ancient city of Shechem was renamed Neapolis, which means Neopolis, new city, and it became called Nablus in the Arabic language. If you have ever spoken with a native Arabic speaker, they do not have any P sound in their language. They will tell you to put your car in the barking lot. Now the side of the well is very well known. It is perfectly hewn from limestone rock, and Mount Gerizim is an entire mount of limestone rock. Joseph's tomb is about 300 meters northwest of the well, all on the outskirts of modern Nablus. There are some things which are taught about Shechem. The, the place is documented in Tanakh, and there is a teaching in Rabbi Yossi's name that the place was predestined for evil. In Shechem, Dina was ravished. In Shechem, his brethren sold Joseph. He was actually sold in Dothan in the vicinity of Shechem. In Shechem, the kingdom of the house of David was divided. We know that as Jacob came out from Laban employ in Genesis 35, 4, they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which were in their hand and all the earrings which were in their ears, and Jacob hid them under the oak which was by Shechem. So this pagan stuff is waiting for them underground. Better he should have melted it down. It is also written in the Talmud, From Shechem they stole him, that is Joseph, and to Shechem we will restore what is lost. And so we see actually his bones do come back to that place. Now we know the history of the Samaritans, who are also referred to as Kothites after their, uh, one of their main cities, which was Kuti, or sometimes they're referred to as Kutheans. And there are many rulings about the commerce and ritual exchange between the Samaritans and the Jews. Lightfoot notes, let no Israelite eat one morsel of anything that is a Samaritan's. Let no Samaritan become a proselyte to Israel, nor let them have a part in the resurrection of the dead. In the Talmud, it is cited, It is permissible to eat on Passover unleavened bread made by a Kuthian, and the eating of such bread satisfies the requirement of Passover. On the other hand, Rabbi Eliezer forbids the eating of such bread because the Samaritans are not familiar with the minutiae of the precept. Rabbi Simeon ben Gamliel says that in all the precepts which the Kuthians do observe, they are much more particular than the Jews themselves. So, verifying the maxim to Jews, three opinions. Continuing in John 4, 7-12. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Yeshua saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Yeshua answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, 
and who it is that saith unto thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldst have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us as well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? So we know generally in this culture, men do not speak to women that they're not related to, particularly in public. And furthermore, as she points out, Jews do not speak to Samaritan. Continuing in verse 13, Yeshua answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water, springing up into everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. And Yeshua said unto her, Go, call thy husband, and come hither. In Jewish tradition, the wise man and wisdom is often compared to a well. The above had the following five disciples, Rabbi Eliezer ben Hyrcanus, Rabbi Joshua ben Hananiah, Rabbi Yossi the priest, Rabbi Simeon ben Nathaniel, Rabbi Eleazar ben Arach. He used to recount their praises. Eliezer ben Hyrcanus is a plastered cistern which loseth, loseth not a drop. Joshua ben Hananiah, happy is she that bare him. Yossi is pious. Simeon ben Nath Nathaniel is a sin fearer. Eleazar ben Arach is a willing spring. From Pirkei Avot. Rabbi Hanina said, if one sees a well in a dream, he will behold peace, since it says, And Isaac's servants digged in the valley and found there a well of living water. Rabbi Netan said, He will find Torah, since it says, Whoso findeth me findeth life, and it is written here, a well of living water. Rabbi said it means life, literally. The Targum from the Song of Songs. And the waters of Shiloh flow gently with the rest of the waters that proceed from Lebanon to water the land of Israel for the sake of those occupied with the words of the law, who are likened to a well of living waters. And by the merit of the oblation of water poured on the altar of the temple that is built in Jerusalem, which is called Lebanon. So as Yeshua associates himself with the living water, he associates himself with these rabbis of great wisdom and also the wisdom of Torah itself. Continuing in verse 17, the woman answered and said, I have no husband. Yeshua said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband, for thou hast five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that sayest thou truly. The woman said unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Now the Talmud requires a man whose wife bears him no children to divorce her and find another. Actually, this is still practiced in some Orthodox communities in Israel. And so perhaps this is the case with this woman at the well. Perhaps after the first husband, she might have found that the fault lay with him. But after two or three, it clearly lies with her. In any event, the personal pain of constant rejection that she must bear would have been overwhelming to her. It is often taught that this woman is at the well at midday, far from the customary time, because she is embarrassed about being a prostitute. Perhaps, however, she is simply disdained for lowly estate, being unable to conceive over time. Now, the Samaritans do not abide by Talmudic law, and that is a lot of the discussion that we see in the Talmud concerning whether a Jewish person can be circumcised by them or eat the food that they prepare and so on. However, the custom or the practice of divorcing a barren woman might have been common among the people of the region at the time. The Samaritans consider only Torah to be scripture. They do not include the prophets. When the woman calls Yeshua a prophet, she is clearly referring to Deuteronomy 18. 18. There are plenty of copies of the Samaritan Torah. We're going to discuss that a little bit. There are about 6,000 differences between the Samaritan Torah and the Masoretic text. Continuing their conversation in verse 20, 
Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Yeshua saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. It seems like they both acknowledge that they have the same Father. Now Moses commanded the altar to be built on Mount Ebal. In Deuteronomy 27, Therefore it shall be, when ye be gone over Jordan, that ye shall set up these stones, which I command you this day, in Mount Ebal. And thou shalt plaster them with plaster, and there shalt thou build an altar unto Yahweh thy God, an altar of stones. Thou shalt not lift up any iron tool upon them. Thou shalt build the altar of Yahweh, thy God of whole stones, and thou shalt offer burnt offerings thereon unto Yehovah thy God. So the temple of Gerizim, the Samaritans, was a rival temple. The story of that temple on Gerizim, coming from Josephus and others, is very well known. It was built in emulation and envy to that of Jerusalem, as of old were Don and Bethel. The Samaritans attributed a certain holiness to the mountain, even after that temple had been destroyed by John Hyrcanus in the 2nd century BCE, but for what reason they themselves could not well tell. However, for the defense of it, the Samaritan text has recorded the words of Moses in Deuteronomy 27.4, For whereas the Hebrew has it, ye shall set up these stones which I command you this day in Mount Ebal, the Samaritan text and version has it in Mount Gerizim. Also it appears in the Samaritan Pentateuch as an alternative version of Exodus 20.17 and has added verses which speak about the importance of Mount Gerizim. So reading directly from the Samaritan Pentateuch, I'll put the website there so you can check it for yourself. Exodus 20.17 Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, and thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his field, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor. And when it so happens that the Lord God brings you to the land of Canaan, which you are coming to possess, you shall set up there for you great stones and plaster them with plaster, and you shall write on these stones all the words of this law. And it becomes for you that across the Jordan you shall raise these stones, which I command you today in Mount Gerizim. And you shall build there the altar to the Lord God of you, altar of stones. Not you shall wave on them iron. With whole stones you shall build the altar to the Lord God of you. And you bring on it ascend offerings to the Lord God of you. And you sacrifice peace offerings. And you eat there, and you rejoice before the face of the Lord your God of you. The mountain, this is across the Jordan, behind the way of the rising of the sun, in the land of Canaan, who is dwelling in the desert before Gilgal, beside Alvin Marah, before Shechem. It's a little bit of an awkward translation, but you can clearly see that all this text about building an altar and being in Mount Gerizim, even though the building of the altar resembles what Moses has written, that we put no iron on it, that we offer our offerings there. This is all the same. But none of this belongs in Exodus 20, which is the telling of the Ten Sayings, or as they're known, the Ten Commandments. The fact that we must worship in spirit and truth does not negate Torah. Torah is truth. Psalm 119, verse 142. Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and thy law, thy Torah, is the truth. Malachi 2.6 The Torah of truth, the law of truth, was in his mouth, and iniquity was not found in his lips. He walked with me in peace and equity, and did turn many away from iniquity.
Continuing in the conversation in verse 25, The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Yeshua saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. And upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with a woman. Yet no man said, What seekest thou? Or why talkest thou with her? So we've already discussed that he would not be talking to a woman that he was not related to, not in public, besides which she is a Samaritan. The Samaritans do not believe in the prophets. When they read Deuteronomy 18.18, 18, they understand that this is a Messiah, not just some other prophet guy. Continuing in verse 28. The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith to the men, Come, see a man which told me all the things that I ever did. Is this not the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came unto him. In the meanwhile his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat which ye know not of. Yeshua saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. Say not ye, There are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, Lift up your eyes, and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit unto life eternal that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And therein is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. So the harvest begins in about two weeks from now, in the middle of the current month, the month uh, which is in Passover. The four months leading up to the harvest uh, are in the traditional Jewish calendar, Kislev, Tevet, Shvat, and Adar. Kislev is the month during which Hanukkah takes place, and perhaps the Samaritans are coming to the well from town. They are traditionally dressed in white and represent the harvest in this picture. The time of harvest is described in Leviticus 23.10. Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When ye come into the land which I give unto you, and shall reap the harvest thereof, then ye shall bring a sheaf of first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. And he shall wave the sheep before Jehovah to be accepted for you. On the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. And ye shall offer it that day when ye wave the sheep, a he lamb without blemish of the first year for a burnt offering unto Yahweh. And the meat offering thereof shall be two tenth deals of fine flour mingled with oil, an offering made by fire to Yahweh for a sweet savor. And the drink offering thereof shall be of wine, the fourth part of a hen. And ye shall eat neither bread, nor parched corn, nor green ears, until the selfsame day that ye have brought an offering unto your God. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. So this comes the day, the Shabbat, after Passover. So the barley, this is the barley harvest, needs to be ready. So we see why the fields are white unto harvest. The corner picture in the upper left-hand corner are the green ears. And when it becomes ready to harvest in the lower right-hand corner, it's not exactly white, but it is a pale color. And here from town come all these Samaritans who are dressed in white. Continuing in verse 38, I sent you to reap that whereon ye bestowed no labor. Other men labored and ye are entered into their labors. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman, which testified, He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them, and he abode there two days. And many more believed because of his word, and said unto the woman, Now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Now, after two days, he departed thence and went into Galilee. So as they have a personal experience with Yeshua, they come to faith. And isn't that the truth? We need to have a personal experience of him, not just hear about him from another person. Of course, in an agricultural society, we expect many parables and comparisons 
for the processes of sowing and reaping, as it is written in Hosea 10, Sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek Yahweh, till he come and rain righteousness upon you. Ye have plowed wickedness, ye have reaped iniquity, ye have eaten the fruit of lies, because thou didst trust in thy way in the multitude of thy mighty men. From the Talmud, Rabbi Yochanan said on behalf of Rabbi Bena'ah, What is the meaning of the verse? Blessed are ye that sow beside all waters, that send forth the feet of the ox and the ass. It means, Blessed is Israel when they occupy themselves with Torah, and acts of kindness their inclination is mastered by them, not they by their inclination, as it is said, Blessed are ye that sow beside all waters. For what is meant by sowing but doing kind deeds, as it is said, Sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap according to mercy. And what is meant by water is Torah, as it is said, O ye who are thirsty, come to the water. And finishing the chapter, So Yeshua came again into Cana of Galilee, where he made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Yeshua was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then said Yeshua unto him, Except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. The nobleman said unto him, Sir, come down, ere my child die. Yeshua saith unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word that Yeshua had spoken unto him, and he went his way. And as he was now going down, his servants met him, and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. Then inquired he of them the hour when he began to amend. And they said unto him, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. So the father knew that it was this, at the same hour in which Yeshua said unto him, Thy son liveth, and himself believed, and his whole house. This is, again, the second miracle that Yeshua did when he was come out of Judea into Galilee. And Father, even now we pray that you would reach down with your mighty hand and remove this fever from the earth. Father, I thank you that people are encountering things that have never been seen, they have an opportunity to examine themselves, to examine their lives, and to turn their face to you. I thank you for all you do and who you are. In Yeshua's name. As we say, Tasimita Inayim Al Hashemayim, keep your eye on the sky, your redemption draweth nigh. Until next time, Shalom.